You are listening to Radiant Creators, a collaborative project composed of people whose passion, purpose, and dedication requires forging their own unique path of empowerment and livelihood. A Radiant Creator isn't making a living, they are living. Welcome to Radiant Creators. Check us out at radiantcreators.com. We're also on alternatecurrentradio.com. Check us out there too. As always, like, comment, and share. That gets the show out there and helps us tremendously. Today on Radiant Creators, we're talking to Fiona Edgar. She's a karmic astrologer and tarot reader from Northern Ireland. She's claircognizant and clairvoyant and has the ability to see past lives, including lifetimes spent on other planets. Fiona has studied astrology and tarot for over 20 years and has been practicing professionally for five years. She's great at what she does. We really got hold of a lot of wisdom in this interview. I think it's pretty great. So enjoy the show. So you've got a very radiant array of offerings and talents on your site, scorpionmoonkarmicastrology.com. And I think maybe a great way to start would be tell us about what you offer on the site, the content that you're putting out. And then also after that, well, then we'll start on, you know, who are you and, and how did you get there? Okay. Yeah. Well, first and foremost, I am a karmic astrologer. So uh, I, I read people's birth charts. Um, I'm able to identify karmically, you know, where they are, their kind of strengths, their weaknesses, their hidden talents, the, the kind of collective story of their past lives. Um, you know, I can also see, identify what's coming up for them in the future. I also read the tarot. Um, I can do past life readings and I'm also clairvoyant. So when a client books me for a reading, I generally use all of those, um, to kind of see where they're at and, you know, answer any questions that they have, how I got there. Uh, I I've been studying everything to do with spirituality and the occult for as long as I can remember. You know, when I was a little kid, I kind of had experiences that I, I suppose weren't exactly normal. Um, and yeah, I just was always aware that there was a whole other world out there that was hidden, which is what the world, uh, what the word occult means. Um, so throughout my teenage years, um, I read lots of books on astrology, spirituality, uh, mediumship, you know, everything really. And I actually studied astrology, I think it's about 20 years now. Um, and I used to do readings for people on, on Facebook. And actually one of my exes said, you know, you're really good at this. Why don't you do this professionally? This was a, a number of years back. So... I decided to set myself up as an astrologer. I made a page on Facebook and my website, and you know, by word of mouth and you know, being on the radio and and things like that, I've I've got to where I am today, and I am delighted and happy to be here. Mystical, unique uh, people. That tends to be a common thing that happens when they're kids. They have mystical experiences. Uh, actually, the earliest experience that I had, I'm sure that I was probably no more than four or five. Uh, I was sleeping and I woke up and I was aware that there was like this figure at the end of my bed. Um, and I knew that, for, you know, I wasn't scared, which is surprising, but I knew that the person that was standing at the end of my bed was not from this world. Um, but I felt quite reassured by their presence. You know, I also had odd dreams. Uh, I used to experience a lot of astral projection. Uh, you know, I, I was aware of kind of leaving my body at night and, you know, com coming back into my body was like a big jump. And actually I told my sister about this and she was able to explain to me what it was. Um, uh, yeah, just, just things like that. And I always was aware that I had, I suppose it was intuition. Um, I was always able to read people quite well and, and know things about them without, without them, them telling me. But I wasn't, 
I wasn't very open about these things because I kind of knew intuitively that I needed to keep them to myself. So you're, you're yeah. living in Scotland right now? Is that where you're at? No, I'm actually in Northern Ireland. No, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, Northern Ireland. Okay. How do you yeah. feel that, uh, is that, is that where you've always lived? Do you feel that, uh, that um, I always feel that, that places, that place has a strength, has, has something to it. I've oftentimes thought that like an accent comes from a place. Do you feel that where you lived actually supported that uh, evolution, that, that connection? Um, I, I guess it's a bit of both. Um, you know, I, I've lived here all of my life apart from a couple of years in my early 30s where I actually lived in the States for a little while. Uh, I lived in Detroit and St. Louis. But yeah, you know, we had Northern Ireland experienced, uh, you know, some terrorism and what we call the troubles. So it's a good place to live now, but when I was growing up in the early 80s, it was quite a violent place. Um, I would say that, you know, because of experiences that I had in my childhood, maybe my gifts didn't, didn't open up as quickly as they should, or, you know, they did open up, but then I kind of suppressed them. So that's kind of hard to say, but the energy of Ireland is very special. Uh, you know, anyone that comes here who is intuitive or gifted says that, you know, there, there are a lot of spirits here. It has a, a rich history. There's an energy to Ireland that you can't explain. Um, yeah, I'm living in the States. I became aware that even more so that I, I came from a, a very special place. So, you know, I'm very, I'm very grateful to be here. I actually live in the countryside, and I live beside a, an ancient, what they call fairy fort. So, you know, it's, it's quite a cool place to live. There's a lot of spirit activity. Certainly, this, there's the sense that you're never alone. Um, have you ever visited here, Craig? I've never been there. Uh, it's definitely on, on the agenda that's going to happen in the next couple of years will be to visit uh, Ireland and actually quite look around while there. Well, fairy forts, those are actually, those weren't necessarily positive things historically, were they? I mean, we see fairies as these, you know, fun things in the garden, and they are. But in Ireland, where the fairies were, that was actually a dangerous place, wasn't it, historically? And I could be way off, I know. Yeah, you're, you're actually right. You know, I think because of Hollywood and Disney and all of that, we kind of get this um, impression that fairies are these little winged tinkerbells that fly around and sprinkle magic dust everywhere. But, you know, in Ireland, they were feared. Um, people used to leave offerings out for them, you know, like a bowl of milk or a slice of cake to kind of appease them. And... Being clairvoyant, I, I can see them, but they really don't look like Tinkerbell. You know, they look quite human in their, their form and their size. So I think it's best to be on the right side of them. Um, you know, they can certainly stir things up and cause misfortune if you, you know, you drop litter or you kind of try to destroy where, they're li where they live. But I think I, I have a good, healthy fear of them, but I appreciate their presence as well. Do you feel that they're present anywhere there is nature, or are there just certain places that they really like to congregate? Yeah, there's definitely uh, some places where they tend to congregate more than others. Uh, where I live, for example, I live in a place called Dromore in, in County Down. The, um, the landscape is very much alive with them, um, but, you know, just because uh, a place tends to have trees or a bit of grass doesn't mean that you'll find them there. They very much like to be left alone, so they'll pick kind of desolate rural areas to live in. And you mentioned that people like to stay on the positive side of them when they're around. Um, it reminds me of something that Eric Rains, someone that we interviewed on the show, mentioned. That he said that if you uh, grow a house plant, let's say you're not in, in the country, you grow a house plant, or if you have some land around you, you grow anything, and you tend it and you love it, then nature itself will actually protect you. You'll start to have this relationship with it that's very close. Are there fairies like that, or are they just basically something you should just kind of leave alone? Like, here's a cookie, and we'll we'll just call it a, a treaty. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, I do think that you can, to a certain extent, you can cultivate relationships with them. Uh, you know, I feel I feel quite close to them, and you know, like I said, I would sometimes leave offerings out for them. But uh, I'm kind of in the minority now. You know, with Christianity uh, becoming, you know, the predominant religion in Ireland, those beliefs have kind of fallen away, but they're still very much present. Uh, but yeah, you know, nature definitely has a, you know, trees have spirits, plants have a spirit, the rivers do, um, and you can connect with those spirits. Um, you know, for example, if you needed to heal some part of your, your personality, um, you can ask the river to help you to cleanse it away and develop a relationship with that spirit. So it's very shamanic in a sense. A karmic and intuit and an intuitive astrologer. Um, so when it comes to intuitive, uh, intuitive astrology, I, I would imagine that anyone who has a naturally strong uh, intuitive nature is going to, of course, you know, in, their intuition will be an aspect of astrology. And I like that because anyone who's does tarot and they just do tarot is sort of limited. Anybody who does astrology and just does astrology is kind of limited. It seems that intuition is really needed to connect all of those dots. So you're doing all of that. And that's that's a good thing. So I'd, I'd ask with intuitive astrology, let's just focus on intuition. And so you noticed as when you were young that you had intuition and then you've been cultivating it. I guess how are some of the method, how are some of the ways that you cultivated it? And then uh, I would say, you know, how can others cultivate intuition, their intuition into their daily lives? Because it really is our you know, sevens, it's our, it's one of our senses that unfortunately our society and its, I guess, city dwelling, somewhat domesticated nature has really, it's like we're missing one of our senses. In fact, we are, you know, how, how can people like, how come you developed it? It was turned on when you were a kid. How'd you cultivate it? And then how can others, what's a good way to start hanging out with your intuition? Yeah, well, you know, I intuition and, and psychic abilities is, is something that you can see in, in a birth chart. So when I do a reading for a client, I, I notice that they have certain planets and certain signs or aspects. You know, I, I can pick up on what those gifts and abilities um, might be. For myself, ex for example, I my sun sign is Cancer, which is uh, one of the most intuitive signs of the zodiac. And my moon sign is in Scorpio, so I am a double water sign. Water people tend to be very, you know, tuned into energies and vibrations. So I, I had that in my favor to begin with. Then I started to do tarot readings, mediumship, uh, you know, astrology. Doing things like that on a regular basis is going to really tune your intuition in. Also, I think... One of the worst things that you can do is to constantly doubt yourself. You know, I, I get clients that come to me and they say, I want to know how to develop my abilities. I look at their chart and I see that they do have them, but they constantly second guess themselves. I think the best thing that you can do is to always go with your first instinct or your first thought. Don't try to, you know, t to talk yourself out of that. Also, you know, when it comes to things like relationships, I, I do find that a lot of spiritual people end up in relationships in the beginning with people that lie to them. It seems to be like some kind of spiritual attack to stop them from developing those abilities. So you need to always trust yourself, uh, learn to trust yourself and to not let other people talk you out of it. Eventually, your your intuition or your, your sixth sense is going to become so strong. Um, that's basically what I did. Um, also, meditation really helps. Turning off your phone, <laughs> which is something that, you know, I'm guilty of that as well. But when you constantly have your phone going, it's interfering with your, your energy, your psychic senses. Um, just being as close to nature as possible. Getting away from the... Uh, noise of Wi-Fi, the uh, the noise of the phone. I mean, a cell phone ultimately is making noise, and it's making uh, a, a radiant 
uh, interference with your natural uh, body's energy. I mean, our heart energy reaches, like the heart chakra energy, it reaches out many feet in every direction. I mean, a good 12 to 15 feet, like right there in your immediate uh, area. I mean, of course, it goes out further, but... Um, if you had the vision to see it, if you used to see somebody with a cell phone, it's just absorbing that energy. It, it's really uh, turning them off. I mean, people don't like. Oftentimes, you can see videos on the internet of people with their with their cell phones doing horrible things, like walking off cliffs, walking into a, a, a signpost, and such like that. And it isn't just because they're not looking; it's because that natural reach that they have with their senses that are very real um, it, is being absorbed by that phone. It's being turned off. So literally, you're like spiritually and, intu and, and, and intuitively blinding yourself. It's almost like walking around on a very real level with a blindfold on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, it, you know, it's, it's quite alarming um, how addicted we are to technology and our phones and quite dangerous. So my advice to anyone would be, you know, turn it off uh, for years and years we got by without having to be in constant contact with each other um, you know it, it is quite worrying how addicted people tend to get to Facebook and they start to crave it and you know yeah just leave those things alone turn your phone off go go outside walk about in the grass um, connect with the elements and your intuition is going to blossom just like a, a cell phone is a technology that helps us communicate with the world that connects us to it, um, truly we could see our intuition as a technology. Ultimately, it's 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 a it's a spiritual technology, an eclectic technology, however we want to call it. It is real and it is a technology, and that's a technology we could be developing, like rather than you know focusing on the phone quite so much, go out and develop your intuitive technology. And wow, you know, you you may feel more connected to all that is than you ever will through a phone. In fact, I, I can pretty much guarantee that, you know, without a doubt. Well, you mentioned that you do past life um, regression or, or, or past life readings. I look at it like a lot of things that most people would find, you know, really out there or very theoretical or imaginary, you know, unreal. I mean, I, I see as, well, very real, of course. <laughs> And, uh oh, there's the dog. One sec. <laughs> hey, that'll do. That'll do, little guy. Hold on. <laughs> One sec. Okay, I'm back. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the, the chihuahua was guarding the castle. Um, so I look at a lot of what is extremely theoretical as just, you know, breaking it down to. Uh, a technology, like somebody we interviewed on the, on the show, um, well, both Eric Rains and actually. Um, Oh, what's his name? Ken Rolla. Uh, they can take the most theoretical concepts and then they can just speak to it so matter-of-factly because ultimately it is real and it is a technology. And so since you actually do work with past life you know, regression or, or connecting people to past lives, how does that technology work? What are you actu what's actually happening when you're doing that? Uh, yeah, well, you know, there are a couple of different methods that I would use to, to tap into to people's past lives. The first thing that I do is to look at the birth chart because we can actually see um, where that person has come from in their past lives, what kind of personality they were, um, what are some of the lessons that they still need to learn. So that gives me a general idea. Um, you know, there are a couple of points in the birth chart, such as the, the lunar nodes, the south node would be um, collectively the person's past lives. Um, you know the kind of the kind of skills that they've developed and the general themes. The north node in the birth chart is kind of where you know the territory that they haven't explored um, that they need to move towards. So the south node, also Saturn, because Saturn is the planet of karma. That would show me some of the karmic lessons that the person uh, still needs to work towards. So I would look at that, first of all. And then usually when I'm reading a chart, I will get information clairvoyantly. You know, I could be looking at someone's Saturn and I will start to see, you know, a face or a landscape 
and I start to get information about who they were. Then also I will use my tarot cards. Um, you know, I, I might ask a question like, show me what this person this person did for a living in their last life or in this particular lifetime. And then I'll be able to get the information from tarot cards. So uh, I don't know exactly where all of this is coming from. You know, it's just, you know, I suppose the, the Akashic records, I'm, I'm tapping into those. I'm, I'm reading the energy in the person's aura because a person's aura contains all of their previous lifetimes as well. Um, I'm not sure how, how other people do it, but those are the methods that I use. I guess you could say having that multi-dimensional consciousness where you can look you know, at multiple timelines at once. So it makes plenty of sense to me. Yeah, your, your site's actually called Scorpio Moon Karmic Astrology. And so you, you have a moon in Scorpio. That's right. That's challenging. Like I've, always, I've, I've often found that most people who have strong Scorpio in their chart, be it rising moon, you know, north or south node, uh, it, it's it, it makes for it, it seems like a hard life. So have have you had the uh, have you found that that having a, a Scorpio moon has been uh, a challenge? I know anything can be made positive, but have you found it to be a bit of a struggle? Because I just noticed, like I say, in people's charts, people who have a strong Scorpio, they have to really uh, turn that self awareness on young, and they have the ability to be super powerful. Or if not, it makes for oh a pretty hard life. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Yeah, it, you know, it has been uh, difficult, very difficult at times. Um, you know, I kind of briefly mentioned earlier about that my family were affected by, you know, the troubles or the terrorism in Northern Ireland. So that happened when I was uh, quite young, at the age of eight. And, you know, Scorpio Moon people can be very guarded with their emotions. They find it very hard to trust others because of experiences that they have had in childhood and that was certainly the case for me. So, you know, I became this person that was always suspicious of other people's motives. Um, I found it hard to trust, but it made me very good at reading other people. Um, I'm very good at reading body language, facial expressions, you know, the, the things that people don't say in that pause. But yeah, my, I do have had a bit of a crazy life at times, full of ups and downs. Um, you know, Scorpio people are very intense. We feel everything so, you know, intensely and passionately. And, you know, we live in a bit of a black and white world. Um, so yeah, there are, you know, there are pros and cons. But yeah, certainly Scorpio people, whether it be in the moon or, or like you say, the sun or the rising, it can be it can be difficult, but the goal is to become the phoenix and to to rise from the ashes. We go through trauma, but then we are reborn through the trauma. Rise from the trauma. That's that's challenging, and I, it seems like with, with uh, I, just got, I just got a hand it to you. I'm glad you're doing well because I've seen it go. It doesn't. There doesn't seem to be a lot of mid range. You know, most people they can have. Well, many people. They can have great stars and they don't really live up to them. Some people, they have crap stars and they live really, really well. And I find that with uh, anyone with a strong Scorpio in their chart, they're either just badass spiritual warriors and they make it happen. They have great gifts or um, they're sociopaths. <laughs> I mean, yeah. so, so I'm sure. So you're on the good side of things and I'm glad you are. So hard stars, yeah. but you're, you're making it happen. Yeah, yeah, thanks. You're right. You know, I, I've noticed that as well. You know, when we have, when we go through trauma, uh, especially during our, our childhood, um, you know, we can either, it's very much like the energy of Chiron. Um, so Chiron is the, the planet of that rules people's wounds, um, but also healing. So we can either use that, that wound to heal ourselves and to help others, or, you know, we can thing like a scorpion and, and hurt other people so personally I, I prefer to be a good person um but yeah some scorpio people can be ruthless <laughs> <laughs> definitely definitely or just kind of trapped in their own stuff you know there, there can be a, a bit of a dark cloud that follows them around i'm glad that you use the north and the south node i've always thought that's kind of the most one of the most powerful aspects of a chart i, I myself look at like 
you know, month of birth, rising, moon, and north and south node. And it seems like to me there's, gosh, you can get so much out of just that. So one question I'd ask as a bit of an astrologer myself, um, do you feel that computers uh, and technology we have now has made better astrologers or maybe a little bit anemic astrologers? Because I feel like... Um, okay, sure, we can see every aspect, and oh my gosh, you can see so much now with the computer when you put the data in. But even with all of that, I don't feel that, mo I will say most, astrologers are very powerful. Um, but it seems like uh, from the tutelage that I had, I was very lucky. I really learned to focus on month of birth, sun, uh, rising, yeah, month of birth, rising, nodes, moon, and just that. I mean, you, you can look at other things too, of course. It's all there. You can look at it. But if you really focus on like the real foundations of the chart and give them some weight, I really find that, gosh, in simplicity is the power. Yeah. I think, um, you know, with with the rise of, of Facebook and I've, I have noticed that um, there are a lot of those kind of astrology meme pages on Facebook and you know, I'm I'm not really sure how I feel about that. I mean, it is it, some of them are funny and clever, but it let's face it, it's trash astrology. Um, so it's you know I, I'm not very comfortable with that because astrology is a very complex subject. It's a very useful subject if you know what you're doing. Um, you know, it can help us with ourselves. It can help us gain self awareness. It helps our relationships. Um, so to see it reduced to this kind of, you know, c comical thing with a few words on a funny picture, I'm not really comfortable with that. And let's face it, it doesn't take a good astrologer to, to be able to create those. Um, you know, on the other hand, there is so much information out there that, w that we didn't have years ago. You know, we can, you know, you can Google everything about the fixed stars you know, about Chiron, you can explore your entire birth chart um, as a, a novice or a beginner astrologer just by Googling all your aspects. So it's kind of up to you what you do with that information. Um, that was one of the ways that I, you know, I became a very experienced astrologer is that, you know, I'd be watching a movie. Um, I would look up the actor's birth chart. I would study it. I would see how it's connected with their, you know, the story of their life. Um, yeah, so you can you can become a very good astrologer by using technology, but you know, please try and stay away from those kind of meme pages. <laughs> oh no, it makes sense, and it seems like a person always has to kind of develop a certain excellence in their own life. Like you, you can't focus on one thing, I believe. Uh, like, I, like I mentioned, people who focus on only tarot, they're really good at, on, at tarot, but maybe they're not even very intuitive or spiritual people, you know, and the same with astrology and such. It seems like you really have to, it seems like, well, you, you self-taught, but it seems like if there was a formal study for people, it would have to have this kind of curriculum of excellence, right? You'd have to work on um, f many disciplines to actually become good at any one or kind of like a jack of all trades master of none often better than a master of one i don't know it takes it's like when you go to college you have to take all these courses that you don't care about to get your degree you know mm -hmm. but i think with uh, any spiritual pursuit you know be it astrology tarot just spirituality enlightenment whatever a person is working on being a healer uh it takes a well-rounded study of of everything or else i don't know a person's just sort of, I don't know, they got a dark cloud over them, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, personally, I have always been fascinated, uh, like I said, with everything to do with spirituality. So um, through my own practices, I kind of developed multiple skills. Um, you know, I think it's a shame to kind of just stay with one thing. Like you say, you know, with the tarot, you know, it's easy to do a tarot reading because, you know, you can look at the pictures. It's pretty obvious what the pictures mean. But to be a really good tarot reader, you need to develop your intuition. So, you know, you can throw in a bit of mediumship and you, you do a reading that changes someone's life. Uh, when people do readings, whether it be tarot intuitive, uh, 
astrology, th those who are hearing it, I mean, uh, like for instance, if a person is, he is a healer and someone comes for a healing, well, if that person is full of trauma and uncertainty and self-doubt and they're healing somebody, well, they're traumatizing that person. They're not healing them. And so, really, it's the same with uh, any other art form. You might say, like tarot or astrology, being intuitive for a person. People take that to heart. And I think that, uh, you know, many who do just one, many people out there are not really striving for that, that, that greater excellence in life so that they're certain that they are giving a person good energy, you might say, giving a person a true, real, open channel to the divine. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. I know exactly what you mean. Also, I think that we need to be careful, and this is something that I, um, you know, that I had to learn as well, is that just because someone, um, you know, is a, claims to be a spiritual person, just because someone is psychic or a healer, that does not necessarily mean that they are a really good person. Um, you know, I've known people that were into mediumship, they practice it professionally or, you know, astrologers and they have been sociopaths um, and, you know, just all around kind of negative, nasty people. So for people that are going for these treatments or readings, um, I would like to say if your intuition is alarming you or alerting you, then you should not work with that person. Um, you know, I have, like I said, that your in intuition is not just limited to to uh, loving spiritual people. Um, there are bad people out there with really good intuition as well. So you you need to be careful about that. Oh, definitely. I think one thing to learn for an individual le has to learn as they go along is your intuition. We can also call it your discernment. Um, it doesn't see things or judge things necessarily in the way that our like waking mind does. Um, if it sees something as beautiful as, as good, if if a light kind of shines and you see a path, oh, go that way. That's great. I mean, there's lots of ways that we're that we feel our intuitive intuitive guidance, which is positive. But sometimes when we really get hit with a negative vibe, people get knocked out of their intuitional resonance. They they think that that isn't necessarily intuition. They, they and they get turned off because. But in truth, intuition discernment. Um, our natural instinct, which is in us, and, and, and it is a spiritual, it's, it's, it's an eclectic technology, it's real. Um, like, I've come across people and been like, oh my gosh, what a black hole, you know, that is a scary individual. And we don't have to judge that, like, we don't have to think, oh, I'm a bad person because I'm thinking that, or I don't want to think ill of somebody, no. Like, we have to sort of let intuition tell us and show us and, and help us feel what is real without, I think, without playing by any rules, without being afraid to let it show us things that are downright nasty. Yeah, yeah, you know, I, I totally agree with you. I think that, um, you know, among the kind of new age community, um, you know, there's a, a certain individuals that, you know, that the whole love and life thing you know, sometimes we have to face the darkness and by pretending that everything is, is rosy and beautiful all the time, we're kind of denying ourselves healing that we need. Um, so, yeah, I would tend to agree with you on that one. What are the benefits? What can a person get? And I might even say a family, really, have in having an astrologer on call, basically. I mean, I certainly know my chart. And, you know, most people that I know know their charts and it's very good to get kind of a checkup every year from an astrologer that you trust. Hey, what's, you know, what, what's happening for me and such like that. And of course, a business like when you incorporate it, that's kind of its birthday and things like that. Um, I guess say, what is the importance? What, what benefits have you seen with your clients of actually having an astrologer that they trust and that they 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 use in their life yeah um well astrology astrology is life um everything in your life is reflected in the heavens above us uh you know the the planets aren't the cause of any issues in our lives they are just a reflection of of choices that we've made and you know energetic influences I suppose the number one use of astrology would be relationship compatibility. So first of all, that would be love. 
um, you know, my client meets someone, they go on a date, they manage to get the person's date of birth and, and birth time, <laughs> and they ask me to do a reading to compare the charts. So I'm able to see whether I think that the relationship will last, um, if it's going to be an honest, a wholesome, fulfilling relationship, uh, if there are any red flags, you know, if it's, for example, if I think the person is going to be dishonest. I, you know, when I look at a birth chart, I can see everything about the person. Um, there's really nothing, nothing is hidden from me. So, you know, certainly it can save us from pretty bad relationships. Um, we can also use astrology to plan, plan important dates such as weddings, house moves. So I, I obviously I astrologically timed my wedding, my wedding date. Uh, it's important to get married on a day when, for example, Mercury is in retrograde, so you're not going to have constant communication issues, or you know, perhaps you know the the marriage isn't going to last. Um, you can literally use astrology for everything in your life, and it is so useful. Um, you can use astrology to see when you may have money issues, or you know, you may get sick, so. You see that you're going to have a, a Saturn transit in your sixth house in your birth chart, which is the house of health. So you think, okay, I've got to go to the dentist and get a checkup. I have to make sure I eat well, um, you know, avoid extreme sports for a while. You know, it's so useful. I just wish that I wish that everyone could learn some astrology or at least have access to a good astrologer. Uh, you know, it was the I think the Catholic Church in the Renaissance period that that banned the use of astrology because they didn't want people having this this much power and control over their own lives. It was integrated, you might say, and then as it was integrated, it was degraded. Yeah. Well, luckily we got away from that, and astrology is everywhere now. So take that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, also, if you you know, here's a great one for anybody listening to this. You know, hey, if you're listening to this kind of a podcast, if you're listening to this, then I think you're probably pretty with it. And if you do meet somebody that you like, I would just be blatantly honest. I would say I need to check your credentials first. What's your date of birth, time, and location? If they can't handle that. Well, you know what? You don't even have to have their chart read. Uh, you know, before I met my husband, and I was I was single for a little while. Uh, I wouldn't date the person unless I saw their charts because, you know, I could tell immediately whether it was going to last or not. And I, I was looking for something, you know, long term. But when I saw my husband's my husband's birth chart, I knew that this that this person standing in front in front of me was, you know, the one or you know, the, the person that, that I was going to marry. So it, it is, it's very useful to kind of back up your own intuition and your own feeling. Even if a person you met had a great chart, uh, if your intuition still said, mm -mm, I don't know about this person, I, I, would, I, I would at least call that a draw, a tie. Like, I wouldn't know what to do. Maybe just pass. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, you know, it, it's also very good for identifying certain patterns that we tend to be prone to. So, you know, I, for example, if I have a client that comes to me and she keeps saying, well, you know, I, I keep meeting these men that are, you know, I, I, I'm so into them, I really like them, but then they always end up cheating on me or using me. So I say, okay, well, let's take a look at your birth chart. And we see that she has, you know, an afflicted Venus, um, which I can see stems back to some issues that she may have had with her father or her childhood. So, you know, just becoming aware of that is enough for her to change her attitude um, and to change actually the type of person that she is attracted to. It's, it's actually, I've seen this before and it's miraculous. The person, when they are healed and when they um, identify the wound from their childhood, they stop becoming attracted to, um, you know, these these people that are really, really just manifestations of the same wound over and over again. Well, also, along with an astrologer uh, that people have, I, I say on call, when you have that, that wise person who's somewhat detached from the situation, who can see it intuitively, 
uh, karmically, they pass lives, they can see the, the tarot of it. I mean, they really have all these tools that they can use. It's definitely helpful because I find that one thing our society is lacking right now, and I think this is huge, is wise counsel. Nobody, We don't really have any elders or, or wisdom is not something which is really sought after. It just seems to me like wise counsel that has those tools available. I mean, oh, it's lacking in our society, in our world. Yeah. I, I agree with you, and it is quite sad. I mean, teenagers today, they don't really have very many good role models. Um, you know, they, they have their parents, um, but if we look at the type of things that, you know, the the artists that they're listening to, you know, there, there really isn't very much wisdom there. So I do think that it's lacking, especially in the in the Western world. But, you know, I think with Saturn and Capricorn, people are starting to maybe come around to the idea that more traditional values are actually better for society. Um, I have noticed that more, you know, younger people, the millennials, some of them are actually starting to, to want to kind of go back to those old traditional values because they are kind of, they're fed up with the way that that modern, modern life is. Um, and they feel this, you know, need to, to return to something more wholesome. Yeah, I mean, here in the West, we have our millennials, well, they're everywhere, but here in the West, we have a lot of millennials that are checking out due to the feels. They're just checked out. Sorry, I can't function this week. Got the feels. Um, but also, we have a lot of really shrewd, very, very smart millennials who are they're creating something very, very good. They're very, very smart. Well, definitely with the Capricorn energy. I mean, I, my moon's in Capricorn, so I know all about, you know, being traditional and uptight and striving for mastery. So if the, <laughs> since that's activated, good. That's definitely a good thing. Because, yeah, because with wisdom in our society, that being something that's, that's lacking, I mean, could you imagine? My dream is everybody grows up with, like, a grandfather like Joseph Campbell and an uncle like Thomas Sheridan. I mean, could you imagine? Oh, my gosh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that would just gosh it just does that would be so amazing and that that's what i'm that's what i'm striving for one thing you mentioned about like looking at the chart and say not like not getting married during mercury retrograde you know or buying a flamethrower or a tank or something like that <laughs> um mercury retrograde is happening right now and so mercury retrograde really is no joke and it does happen a couple times a year and i would say as we I would ask you, I have a couple questions on it, because it's very relevant, it's happening right now. Um, what is it? How would you describe Mercury retrograde, this dark cloud that goes over our lives a few times a year? <laughs> I'm being eccentric. Yeah, yeah you know, it, it is a dark cl cloud. It, it is a bit of a drag. Um, it, it upsets things. But really, it's just bringing our awareness to issues in our lives that, that need fixed. So, you know, something is broken, something isn't working. You know, a lot of people uh, have relationship issues and communication issues, but it's, it's an opportunity for us to review and reorganize, you know, things in our lives that aren't necessarily working the best. So we do have to go through it three times a year. You know, it's like this, oh no, it's Mercury retrograde. Let's, let's hide at home and, you know, lock the doors. But, you know, you just have to get on with it. And the best thing to do is identify what the spiritual lesson of the retrograde is going to be before it starts. So if you're not familiar with your chart, you can book a reading with an astrologer. The astrologer will say, will be able to tell you which life issues are going to be affected. You know, is it going to be your job, your home? So once you know what to expect um, and identify the lesson, you know, it should be it should be less difficult than previous retrograde. So this one that we're going through at the moment, I think is pretty, pretty bad. But we also have Mars retrograde, which is really difficult. Um, pretty much everyone that I know has been struggling. Um, and going through, you know, emotional issues and generally not having a very good time. You know, we're having these like crazy forest fires all over the planet. It's kind of a reflection of Mars retrograde. A lot of people are, are angry, you know. But listen, we're going through this for a reason. 
we also have Venus retrograde coming up towards the end of the year. This year is very important in terms of the evolution of humanity. I think we are all being asked to examine ourselves, develop self-awareness, um, you know, own up to your own crap and just try and fix ourselves and progress spiritually so we can move this planet, you know, into, into another dimension or onto some better times and kind of get rid of some of the darkness. But we can't just sit here and wait for a Messiah to come and save us. Um, we need to do it ourselves, individually and collectively. So these retrogrades are actually a really good thing. The worst thing to do is just to sit inside and say, oh no, my life sucks, Mercury is terrible, and you know, just work with it, um, you know, see what you need to fix about yourself, and next year is going to be so much better. Believe me, I know there are times when I see Mercury retrograde coming up and I think, well, you know, I could just stock up on red wine and chocolate and just, you know, <laughs> just, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just just hide in the house for three weeks. You know, I could do it, but, you know, I, I guarantee Mercury will find some reason to scoot you right out the door because that's how it is. It's definitely, like you mentioned it, it's super helpful if people do have their chart read and, and they do know it and they have an astrologer that they can work with because oftentimes people just think, okay, it's Mercury retrograde. This is happening. Um, but in truth, I mean, there's Mercury retrograde for your country. When was your country born? There's Mercury retrograde for your city, such like that. For And also there's Mercury retrograde, of course, for you. So to know what house it's happening in definitely changes everything. And that, that's really going to help a person, if nothing else, know what to focus on. It really gives a lot of insight because going into Mercury retrograde blind, well, it just sucks, but you don't know why. <laughs> but if you can focus your effort, then maybe it's a lot more rewarding. Yeah, uh, you know, in my own chart, this current Mercury retrograde is going through the fourth house. So that's the house that, that rules my home. And, you know, we just, we moved house um, a little while ago. So the retrograde for me has been about, you know, getting the plumbing sorted, getting the water connected, you know, just, just things like that. So I knew all of that was coming prior. Um, I knew to kind of keep extra money saved so that I would have the money to spend on these things in my new home. You know, it's just it's stuff like that what, that we need to be aware of before it starts. During Merc Mercury Retrograde, you often feel just a mental dullness. It's it, it makes it sort of hard to think and maybe hard to move. And I find that if you will just keep going, keep moving. It's hard. It can feel like it's hard to think. It can feel like you're sort of underwater and you have to kind of swim your way across the room because it's hard to move. Um, you know, red wine and chocolate does help. But besides that, um, do you feel that if you are diligent and do your best, strive for certain excellence and understanding of how Mercury is affecting you in your chart during retrograde really pays off. It pays off big time for things that you may have been working on for years. Yeah, yes, I think so. You know, it's also Mercury retrograde is also a time of completion and, and getting things wrapped up. So, you know, any ongoing projects that you started before the retrograde, you know, things can intensify during the retrograde period and, you know, you, you end up getting stuff done. But, yeah, you know, it's, it's I suppose, our relationships with other people. Um, it's always good to take a look at your partner's charts um, or your kid's chart before the retrograde hits so you can see if your partnership is going to be affected by you know, any retrograde issues such as, you know, your finances, things like that. So what's going on right now with all the eclipses? Yeah, well, you know, we're just, we're wrapping up this eclipse season. Um, I think that there's, a, the last eclipse is on Friday, I'm pretty sure. It's either Thursday or Friday um, or over the weekend. Um, things have been crazy for the past, the past six weeks in particular, I think for everyone. So whatever your personal eclipse story has been, um, you know, it's going to start wrapping up by the weekend. You should feel an ease off of the pressure. Uh, you know, I, I could be general. Eclipses bring 
bring you know great changes in in our lives. They are wild cards. It's hard to know what to expect. Um, they can herald massive life events such as you know a birth, a death, a marriage, a change of location, you know things like that. So, but what I know is that collectively everyone has been feeling immense pressure. So yeah, towards the the weekend things are going to start wrapping up and we sh we should see a change for the better. After that, um, I think we only have like two weeks left of Mercury retrograde, I'm pretty sure. Mars will start to go forward again at the end of the month. So hang in there, everyone. It, it is going to get better. Um, then after that, we have Venus retrograde, which is not as, not as tough, emotionally speaking, as what we've been going through. So, like I said, all of this is for a reason. Um, you know, it's about working through the shadow side, working through the kind of, um, you know, the, the dark stuff, uh, you know, childhood issues, things like that. So, it, it is for, a, you know, a very good purpose. I think this interview is very timely because it's something that I think people will uh, benefit from and benefit from hearing that because... This is, yes, the last few weeks, this Mercury retrograde uh, and eclipse season and Mars retrograde all put together has been, I think, a challenge for well everyone. And that, that goes for people who know about astrology, who think about it, who know Mercury retrograde is happening, who know Mars retrograde is happening. You've got Mars retrograde happening and, well, California's on fire, the biggest, you know, fires they've ever had in the north part of the state and such. And so... You know, for us that kind of know what's going on, have some insight, it's very helpful, but then many don't. So for just en endless people out there, they've been living through quite the challenge. And uh, maybe one of the things that changes it, puts it all in better perspective, is um, you can see this Mars retrograde and this Mercury retrograde and the eclipse season as it's your pilgrimage, really, into when, when you look at it very personally, into how it affects your chart. So really, I, I look at now, I was thinking of while we've been talking is that especially when it comes to retrogrades like Mars and also Mercury retrograde, which happens three times a year, look at it as a pilgrimage into your own stuff and how it affects your chart. It's a very personal experience. Yeah, yeah, it really is. And, you know, like you were saying, we we know about astrology. The best thing about astrology is that when we do have, you know, difficult times, we know we, we can look at the astrology chart and the transits and we can kind of get a very good idea as to when it's going to end. So, you know, that's why everyone should get their chart read. <laughs> oh, definitely, yeah. And I never give myself Mercury much leeway. I'm like, nah, I'm, I've, never, I've never been much of a shadow person. I mean, I maybe I should believe it but i think mercury kind of clicks on and clicks off when it comes to retrograde i don't i've never put a lot of uh weight on the shadow period before and after yeah it, the shadow period can actually be more intense than the actual retrograde you know i, I think the shadow period that comes after the retrograde is usually quite um quite intense and you know it feels like you know mercury isn't direct so we just have to remember that we have a little bit longer to wait after that. But, yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure that most people out there are going to be happy that when this retrograde is done because it has been a, a very hard one. Yeah, I usually handle the shadow periods before and after just with denial. That's usually what I do. I just, I think, no, <laughs> it hasn't started or no, it's over. No, we're done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Although that's probably not very effective, but we all have our stuff to work on. That, that, that'll that be part of my pilgrimage this retrograde season or retrograde period and fire season. And well, thanks for your time today. This has been great. And what I'd, I'd say is, hey, where can people get a hold of you? Yeah, um, well, you know, they can check out my website, um, www.scorpiomoonkarmicastrology.com. Uh, there's a bit about me. I, you know, the type of readings that I do. I do astrology, past life, relationship compatibility. You know, I can do a reading on whatever the person needs. Or, you know, you can look me up on Facebook. My name is Fiona Edgar. I also have a little page on Facebook where I do regular astrology updates. Uh, if you just type in Scorpio Moon Karmic Astrology and Tarot, it'll come up on Facebook. So, 
yeah, you know, everyone is welcome to connect with me if they wish. All right. Well, that sounds great. And thank you so much 